Solar now employs more people nationwide than any other form of energy for electricity production. New laws are changing the face of the solar industry in Michigan and Minnesota. And a new survey uh, tries to get a sense of how rural people are viewing the growing number of large solar installations that are popping up across the country. I'm Jay Warmke with Blue Rock Station, and this is the news from the solar industry for the week of July 17th. Well, solar now, according to a recent uh, report from the U.S. Department of Energy, their 2023 jobs report, uh, indicates that solar now employs many more people than in all other forms of energy that's used for electric generation. Um, solar accounts for about 340,000 jobs nationwide. In second place is the wind industry, and the wind industry uh, employs about 125,000 people, but that industry is growing at a rate of about 20% a year. Third place, natural gas. Even though natural gas accounts for about 40% of all of the um, electricity generated in the country, it only employs about 118,000 people. Wind and solar are much more labor intensive uh, than, than the fossil fuel industry. And of course, coal, which has been declining rapidly in recent years, now only employs about 55,000 people in actual coal mining jobs, about a third of those are in West Virginia, uh, bulk of them up in the Wyoming, um, uh, North Dakota area, South Dakota region. And uh, there are about another 11,000 or so that are employed in the various uh, coal powered power plants. Now about half of these coal power plants are scheduled to close over the next three years. So we should see a, a declining, a continued decline in coal mining and coal jobs. DTE Energy, which was formerly known as Detroit Edison Energy, uh, has announced that it will close all of its coal power plant, case in point, by the year 2032. Um, this is ahead of schedule, about nine years, or three years, sorry, ahead of schedule. And these closures, they anticipate, will reduce the carbon emissions from DT Energy by about 85%. Now, all of these plants that are being closed will be replaced with renewable energy generating facilities, wind and solar. Um, most of these will be owned by the utility, but a number of them will be uh, purchased in through purchase, power purchase agreements from third party vendors. They anticipate that this will generate in the neighborhood, this transition, about $11 billion in renewable energy investment in the state of Michigan. Now, as part of this transition to renewable energy, um, the uh, utility has also agreed to raise the cap of, of rooftop solar from 1% to 6%. So basically what they're saying is, is they will agree to accept net metered agreements uh, with customers before it had a very restrictive 1%. So uh, it was limited to the first 1% that would install solar on their home. Now they're raising that up to 6%, which brings it more in line with much of the rest of the country. A new law in the state of Minnesota uh, around community solar is, is under consideration. Now, Minnesota is the most successful and largest state when it comes to community solar projects. There are about 30,000 customers who are participating in community solar projects, and that represents about 800 megawatts of generating capacity through these. Now, community solar is essentially where a company or a utility develops a large solar plant, and then those homes that otherwise could not afford or were not suitable for solar on their rooftop can purchase a portion of this larger array and then apply the power that's produced to their own utility bill so that you don't have to have a hundred different small systems installed on rooftops. You have one big system and then the production is allocated across those hundred households, for example. Now, Minnesota formally required that if you were going to participate in one of these community solar projects, that the project had to be located in the county where you reside or in an adjacent county. 
and that all of these projects were limited to one megawatt or smaller. Well, what this ended up doing was creating a backlog of applications for interconnections around populated areas, especially around the Twin Cities of St. Paul and Minneapolis. So what this House Bill 2310 is now doing is it's loosening up this geographic restriction so that you can spread out the development over a broader geographical area. And it's also increasing from one megawatt to five megawatts, the size restriction. Uh, it also puts in a number of significant um, incentives to try and direct low income customers towards these community um, solar projects. Now before we finish up the solar news for this week, just wanted to point out that solarpvtraining.com has a few courses available for uh, solar certification by, uh, between now and the end of this year. We do have a one week course at Zane State College, week of August 14th through the 19th. We have a hybrid course, several of the hybrid courses, where we do essentially online lectures, about 46 hours of lectures, and then weekly Zoom meetings. And then that culminates with a two-day session face-to-face. -face. Uh, the first one is in late September, the September 23rd and 24th at Marietta College. Then there's also one at Hiram College, October 7th and 8th, and another one at um, MeLink. This is through the University of Dayton, October 14th and 15th, and then another in Marietta College. So I invite you to um, take part in those. And a new survey by Berkeley Labs in association with Michigan State University, the University of Michigan, and NREL, the National Renewable Energies Labs, uh, is trying to get a sense of how all of the various stakeholders react and feel about these large solar projects that are beginning to pop up around the country. In fact, this is a very significant market segment because about half of all of the new energy that was put onto the grid, the generating capacity, are large utility scale solar projects. Uh, this was in 2022. So what, what they did is they had a number of intensive um, meetings with um, the various stakeholders, the developers, residents, farmers, people nearby these, these projects to just get a sense of their feeling. And what they did find is a number of the concerns that were um, raised had to do with the visual or the aesthetic impact on the countryside that these projects have. Also, um, what kind of land impacts it was going to um, be, like flooding or the fact that you were removing farmland from productive uh, use and, and transitioning it to uh, renewable energy. There was also a lot of um, rural versus urban tension. A lot of the rural residents did not like the idea of city folks, you know, coming in to tell them how they should live their lives. And um, the rural population did not highly prioritize climate change as a reason for this transition. Um, to them, it was primarily aesthetics and, and economics. Um, and they did not they were not fully aware of the economic benefits generally that were being um, brought by these projects. In fact, there was a great deal of resentment expressed for towards those people that were going to economically benefit from these projects. The fact that their neighbors were going to get paid a lot of money, but they did not see any economic benefit. Now, what the developers found is if communication began early on in the project and they could begin to inform people as to what the aesthetic impact would be and also the financial impact to their communities, the development of roads, things like that, that there was a lot less development tension if this communication was um, positive and took place very early. And that's the news from the solar industry for this week. We'll see you next week.